From beginning to end, the name of God in the Hebrew Bible is the divine name. As early as Genesis 4.26, it says people were calling on this name. The book of Genesis also indicates the patriarchs were aware of it as well. But when we get to Exodus 6, we read something peculiar. God says to Moses, I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as El Shaddai, but by my name the Lord I did not make myself known to them. So according to this verse, the patriarchs did not know about the divine name. They only knew him as El Shaddai. The divine name was not revealed until God appeared to Moses on Mount Sinai. Because of this, many scholars say this is evidence for the documentary hypothesis of the Pentateuch. Which is the hypothesis? It was originally four different sources that were stitched together. The J source taught the patriarchs knew the divine name. But the P source taught the divine name was not known until Moses. The redactor allegedly combined the sources into one and didn't bother to fix this issue, preserving the texts as they were. However, this is only one possibility. If we dig deeper into the text and the cultural context, this may not be an apparent contradiction, but may be a misunderstanding on our part. In terms of support for the documentary hypothesis, Exodus 6.3 is considered to be vital. Source critics use this verse as evidence the Pentateuch is different sources that were stitched together. When a verse from Genesis mentions the patriarchs uttering the divine name, it likely belonged to J or E, which is also said by some scholars to be one source referred to as non-P. In the hypothesized P source, the divine name cannot show up until after Exodus 6. Allegedly, the redactor combined non-P and P as they were and didn't feel the need to smooth out this contradiction. According to Richard Elliott Friedman, the person who set out to assemble them had to have exceptional literary sensitivity and exceptional skills. He had to have a sense of which contradictions were tolerable to readers and which were not. He had to make the jagged edges smooth to make pieces of stories that were never meant to go together flow comfortably. His only guideline seems to have been to retain as much of the original text as possible, without intolerable contradictions. So allegedly, having this issue in the text must have been a tolerable contradiction for the redactor, so he left it as is. But we have to ask if this is a satisfactory explanation. It seems like a pretty big issue if it means what source critics state it means, as it allegedly shows a pretty big break from the narrative we find in Genesis. Moreover, according to many source critics, J or non-P is the oldest account. It seems odd that later sources like P would offer a revised history where their own patriarchs, including Israel himself, did not know the divine name that was so sacred among Israelites. Also, Jewish commentators were aware of this issue and over time offered reasons to account for this potential contradiction. There does not seem to be a good reason given as to why this was a tolerable contradiction for the earlier redactor, but an intolerable issue for later Jewish writers and an apparent contradiction for later source critics. Friedman also believes there are several additions a priestly redactor made around this section. So it would not have been hard for the hypothesized redactor to add an additional line to smooth this issue with Exodus 6 and make it cohere with the non-P account throughout Genesis. And we can also ask, if this issue was a tolerable contradiction for the redactor, then it also could have been a tolerable issue for authors who could have composed the Pentateuch as it is. Why would it have been a problem for an author if it was not a problem for a redactor? Perhaps there is something we're missing here that indicates this is not a contradiction, and therefore is not necessarily evidence the Pentateuch is different sources stitched together. One possibility is what the scholars F.I. Anderson and Dwayne Garrett argue, which is that Exodus 6.3 may not be translated properly. Anderson suggests the passage contains something called a non-contiguous parallelism, so what is stated in the second half is a repeat of what was stated in the first half, meaning the second half of the verse is meant to be understood as a rhetorical question. So he argues it should really be translated as, I am the Lord. I made myself known to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, as El Shaddai. My name is the Lord. Did I not make myself known to them? Dwayne Gard adds grammatical points to help support this. 
First, if the traditional translation is correct, it would mean the preposition be must perform double duty. Garrett argues the overall construction of the verse does not support this. The expression cannot be a direct object of the verb, because a nifal form that is here is reflexive in meaning. And also in Hebrew, it is unusual for the subordinate phrase to come before the negative low. All in all, Garrett and Anderson suggest the internal evidence suggests the verse actually contains a rhetorical question. It is not saying the patriarchs did not know the divine name, but reminding Moses with a rhetorical question that they did know his divine name, and by his name he made covenants with the patriarchs, which the exodus from Egypt would finally fulfill. T. Desmond Alexander also adds that the author redactor responsible for the inclusion of Exodus 6.3 within the Pentateuch did not perceive it as contradicting numerous passages in Genesis, which clearly state or imply that the name was known to the patriarchs. In other words, perhaps we have mistranslated and misunderstood this verse. It was not a contradiction, but meant to cohere with the narratives throughout Genesis, where the patriarchs knew of the divine name. However, to be fair, we should note a lot of scholars do not agree the verse has been mistranslated. But even if this is true, it does not mean the verse contradicts the narratives of Genesis. Exodus 6.3 may be more about the function of the name, rather than knowledge of it. In the ancient Near East, names were not arbitrary or accidental. They expressed a meaning that was essential to a function. Jean Batero said, We have known for a long time that the name in ancient Mesopotamia was not, as in our own view, an epiphenomenon, a pure accident extrinsic to the object. The ancient people were convinced that the name has its source not in the person who names, but in the object that is named. That it is an inseparable emanation from the object, like a projected shadow, a copy, or a translation of its nature. They believe this to such an extent that in their eyes to receive a name and to exist, evidently according to the qualities and the representations put forward in the name, was one in the same. Names are more than mere identifiers. They express the function of a thing, a person, or a deity. Deities often had multiple names for their various functions and attributes. In the Enuma Elish, Marduk is given 50 names for all the functions he has acquired. Amun-Ra was said to have names without number. The fact that God has multiple names in the Bible expresses his power and how he was able to fulfill multiple roles. But with this known, in the ancient cultural context, to ask for a deity's name was not merely to find out his or her identifying title. It was asked more about who the deity was and what their purpose or function was in that instance. So in Exodus 3, when Moses asked God, what name should he give to the people of Israel? God replies, Say this to the people of Israel, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. Not only does this suggest the people of Israel would have been aware of the divine name, but it also suggests that God was giving more than a name by which Moses could stand behind. He was giving a specific purpose or function by which God was now manifesting for the people of Israel. Moses was asking, Give me one of your names that best aligns with the task you're sending me on. The meaning behind the divine name was associated with God's unique nature, but with regards to how he related to his people, it was associated with deliverance and fulfilling his covenantal promises. God has many names in the Bible. Each is associated with a role or function he fulfills for his people. The divine name was associated with deliverance and God fulfilling his covenantal role with the people of Israel and their forefathers. In Genesis 1, the general term Elohim is used, but when the story moves on to focus on God creating a relationship with humanity, the divine name is now used. In Genesis 28, when Jacob makes a vow to God, the divine name is used to signify Jacob is now devoted to him alone. In Genesis 22, when God stops Abraham from sacrificing Isaac, the divine name is introduced. T. Desmond Alexander says, By changing the divine epithet at this point, attention is drawn to the fact that the Lord is the God of deliverance, as at the Exodus. However, as David Carr notes, not every time the author switches between the divine name and Elohim does it necessarily signify something important. The using of different divine designators in the Pentateuch may not always be meant to indicate something unique. But in many places, the divine name is associated with deliverance and fulfilling a covenantal promise. Therefore, 
John Walton argues that in Exodus 6.3, God is not giving a name to Israel they have never heard, but revealing a function they have not yet experienced. As we noted, names are not merely identifying titles, but revealed the function of a deity. In Exodus 6.3, God was saying that he was now living out a function the patriarchs did not get to experience, namely deliverance from Egypt and fulfillment of his promise to the patriarchs that their descendants would inherit the land of Canaan. Walton puts it like this, In this sense, the Lord was not presented as a name they have never heard of before, but as a name representing a function that they had not as yet experienced. The Lord, who made promises of land to their forefather, was now ready to function in that implied capacity. He was forming a relationship with the family of Abraham and was electing them as a people to populate the land. Similarly, J. A. Motyer translated the verse as, I showed myself to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob in the character of El Shaddai, but in the character expressed by my name, I did not make myself known to them. In other words, God was saying in Exodus 6 that he was not known to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob by the function of the divine name. They had not experienced the promises fulfilled associated with the divine name in their day. Therefore, God could say they had not known him by that name because they didn't live to experience the function of it. Reverend Childs even says, The message which Moses is commanded to announce to Israel both begins and ends with the proclamation of the name, I am the Lord. The content of the message, which is bracketed by the self-identification formula, is actually only an explication of the name itself and contains the essence of God's purpose with Israel. First, there is the promise to deliver, I will redeem you with an outstretched arm. Secondly, there is an adoption into the covenant as the people of God. I will take you for my people, and I will be your God. Thirdly, there is the gift of the land, which had been promised to the fathers. I will give it to you for an inheritance. The name functions as a guarantee that the reality of God stands behind the promise and will execute its fulfillment. Because names were associated with functions in the ancient world, stating this did not necessarily mean they had never heard of the divine name but more likely was understood to mean they had not experienced the functions and roles associated with the name. Thus, Exodus 6.3 does not contradict the patriarchal narratives. The patriarchs knew the divine name, but did not live to experience the functions and fulfillments associated with the divine name. Beyond this, Gordon Wenham argues the divine name could not have been known before Moses, because no place names are associated with the divine name. In Genesis, when the patriarchs name places or people, they constantly name by associating with the name El. So he suggests later authors rework the patriarchal narratives to include the divine name. But if this was truly the case, then they could have reworked many of the place names as well, but they chose not to. Additionally, the narratives in Genesis often invoke the divine name in speeches that likely were the result of well-known oral traditions. And in Genesis 22, after Isaac is delivered, Abraham names the place with the divine name, which was associated with the Lord providing for them. So we do have an instance of a place name associated with Abraham that invoked the divine name. Source critics often assign this passage to the work of a later redactor to preserve their hypothesis the divine name was not known to the patriarchs. But if any time there is a problem with the documentary hypothesis, a redactor can be invoked, are we really letting the data inform us? Or is the documentary hypothesis assumed to be true, and all issues are waved away by constantly appealing to a redactor? As Joshua Berman said, When any issue arises that creates trouble for the documentary hypothesis, it is quarantined under the guise of editorial interpolation, disallowed rhetorical, and hortatory contact with the rest of the passage, lest it contaminate that source's hypothesized ideological purity. George Fisher says, the term redactor in particular serves for some of today's exegetes as a kind of grab bag, covering almost any intervention by the ancient writers, thus permitting them to explain omissions, additions, changes, etc. Thus it seems the patriarchs were aware of the divine name, even if they did not live to see its functions played out in the later Exodus event. Merely appealing to a redactor to explain the verse that speaks to the patriarchs knowing the divine name seems ad hoc. Finally, to reiterate, the documentary hypothesis posits a redactor who combined the four sources and smoothed out contradictions between them. But for some unknown reason, he left an intolerable contradiction with Genesis 
right in Exodus 6.3. But if this was actually a tolerable issue for the redactor, then it is unlikely he understood it in the same way modern source critics do. And it is more likely he understood the verse as not contradicting the narratives that depict the patriarchs as knowing about the divine name. But this then equally means authors could have written the Pentateuch as is, instead of it being multiple contradictory sources stitched together. Again, if this issue wasn't a problem for the hypothesized redactor, why would it have been a problem for authors who could have composed the Pentateuch as it is? When proponents of the documentary hypothesis use this verse to argue the Pentateuch is four different sources, they ultimately undercut the hypothesis when they posit a redactor who didn't see this as an intolerable contradiction. Because if it wasn't a contradiction for the hypothesized redactor, it also equally would not have been a contradiction for authors who composed the Pentateuch as is. It is more likely this was a tolerable verse because there was never an issue to begin with. Exodus 6.3 may have been meant to be a rhetorical question, or it signified God was manifesting a function associated with the divine name that was promised to the patriarchs. Given this, it doesn't seem there is a break in the Pentateuchal narrative, and therefore, there is no reason to posit different sources that were stitched together.